Good morning, church. Please join me as we read out of the scripture out of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 uh, through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. For most of his career, my dad worked for a Christian television station. And so uh, one of the cool things that that meant for me is that every once in a while when when I was a kid, I got to join him and go to the office with him. And so going to a TV station is your office. That was kind of a cool place to go. Uh, So I got to see how a TV studio works. I got to to go where the the regular audience, where they weren't allowed to go. I got to walk behind the stages and the sets. I got to, to meet people who I had only seen on the screen, but I actually got to meet them in person. And I learned, and this is probably most importantly of all of it, I learned where the kids' favorite place to go was in a TV station. And that was the green room. Because in the green room, which is where all the guests get to go, there's always food and treats and sweets, and you can have as much as you want. And that was a fantastic place to go. But I got to see others, or I got to see things that others couldn't see on TV because my dad showed me what was behind the scenes, what was behind the veil of the TV screen. And once you've seen behind the veil, you realize there's much more there than meets the eye. Well, in a sense, that's what we see happening in Mark chapter 9. Jesus takes three of his disciples up to a high mountain, and and God his Father is there, and Jesus shows his disciples a glimpse of what's behind the veil. Verse 2 says, he was transfigured before them. The word means to to change or to transform. And so if you're familiar with the Transformers and and you know who Optimus Prime is, uh, you know that Optimus Prime looks like just a regular old freight truck. Well, not exactly a regular freight truck. It's got nice painting and all that. but, But it looks like a freight truck and you just see it and you say, well, that's a truck. But what does Optimus Prime do? He transforms. And so when that comes... And then you have this being, this identity that is revealed underneath that truck. Well, in a similar way, Jesus appears to transform in front of his disciples. And Peter and James and John get to look behind the veil of the humanity that Jesus took on when he came to earth and to reveal his true glory in who he is. And they get to see what others hadn't yet seen. Because for a moment, they get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus, the Son of God, who Psalm chapter 104, verse 1 says, is clothed in splendor and majesty. And seeing behind that veil, it changed them. Now, it didn't change them right away. We'll see that in the verses that follow, that they still didn't get it. They're still struggling to see and to hear what Jesus is saying. But about 30 years down the road, the transfiguration of Jesus will be the event that Peter references in 2 Peter chapter 1, that was our scripture reading, as a call from God himself to honor Jesus, his son. A call for people to hear his words and to pay attention to him. 
and a confirmation of everything that Jesus has said in the past so that those who follow Jesus would have a solid hope for the future and be confident in his plan to come again. And so this morning, as we take a look, a closer look at what happened at Transfiguration, my hope is that it will do all of that, all that same thing it would do for you. That seeing Jesus as Peter and James and John, as they saw him, it will lead you also to honor Jesus for who he is. That you too would want to hear Jesus as he speaks to you through his word. And that you too would anchor your hope to Jesus so that no matter what comes, that you would see Jesus as glorious and full of hope in all of it. Glorious. You know, something that is glorious is something that is worthy of fame or admiration. It is striking in beauty and splendor. And you've all seen glorious things, haven't you? Uh, perhaps this week you got a great view of Mount Hood, and, and as you were looking, you thought, this is a glorious view of Mount Hood. Maybe you were listening to some music, and as you heard the song or some orchestra or something, you said, this is a glorious song. I love how this sounds. It, it, it brings me to awe. Or, or maybe you watched your team win a glorious victory. Well, this morning, as we go to the Scriptures and we prepare to take communion, my hope is that you will be led to see Jesus as supremely glorious. That he is supremely worthy of fame and adoration and supremely striking in beauty and splendor. And in seeing him in that way, that it will lead you to worship him, not only in the songs that we sing today, but it will lead you to worship him every single day this week. And so that's our goal to go to the scriptures this morning. So let's pray because we need the Lord to work. Father, thank you again for the privilege of coming to this place to open the scriptures and to see Jesus. Jesus, thank you for how glorious you are. Thank you that we get to see it. We get to gaze upon your beauty as we, as we read about you today. Jesus, be glorified, be praised, be honored. May we be in awe of who you are. And that that awe would, would not simply be confined to this room, but that it would lead us every single day this week to be amazed by who you are, and that that would flow out of us for the people around us. That people would say, who is this Jesus that amazes you so much? And we could tell them about you. We could tell on you to them. So Lord Jesus, help us. Teach us and train us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. You can take out your sermon notes if you're going to use those. And as we come to this passage, there are some things in the Old Testament, as we've done a lot in the Gospel of Mark, because you need to kind of understand the context. Uh, we need to understand a little bit of the Old Testament context in order to know what's going on. And you actually have to go back at least to the book of Exodus. Uh, during that time, Moses was leading the people of Israel, and in Exodus 24, God told Moses to bring with him uh, the, the 70 elders of Israel and, and three men that he named in particular to bring them with him and to go up to Mount Sinai, Sinai to meet with God. And the presence and the glory of God came down in the form of a cloud, and it covered the mountain for six days. And then God called to Moses to speak with him from within the cloud. So that's Exodus 24. Well, Moses would go back up the mountain to meet with God more times. And in Exodus chapter 34, verse 29, Moses came down the mountain to the people. And because he had been in the presence of God, Moses' skin and his face, if you remember the story, it was shining so brightly that he had to put a veil over it. And so Moses had a special relationship with God. But Moses is going to die. And so before he died, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses told the people of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And so the people of Israel were waiting for this prophet like Moses to come. Now fast forward to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, God spoke about a servant of the Lord who would come in the flesh and he would suffer for the sins of people, but by his wounds, people would be healed. And so they were also waiting for a servant who would suffer on their behalf. And so a prophet like Moses and a servant who would suffer. 
Fast forward again, we go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, book of Daniel. Daniel sees a vision of one like a son of man, someone who looks human. But he's coming with the clouds of heaven, and God gives him an everlasting kingdom over all the nations of the world. And so they're also promised a son of man who would rule as God's king over the people. And then we come to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, the people were told that a messenger would come before the Lord himself would come to his people. And in chapter 4, Elijah is said to be the one who will come before the coming of the Lord. And so they were looking for Elijah to come before the coming of the Lord to reign on the earth. So we have a prophet like Moses a savior who would be a suffering servant, a son of man who would rule over the earth, and the appearance of Elijah before the Lord himself came to them. Those are these characters who the Old Testament prophets had been pointing the people to. Now, when Jesus came, the Jews at the time, they didn't know that all of those roles would be fulfilled in one person. In fact, the thought of a prophet like Moses also being a son of man and also being a suffering servant, that that wasn't something they were even going to consider. But we see all of those roles come together here in the first 13 verses of Mark chapter 9, and Peter and James and John are given some huge clues that Jesus is the one to fulfill all of them. So look with me at verse 1. Jesus is foretold about his death and resurrection, and Jesus promises this to his disciples. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now there are varying opinions as to what Jesus means by coming with power, but, but given where Mark goes in the very next verse, it seems that Jesus' promise is a reference to the transfiguration of Jesus. He says, some standing here will see the power of the kingdom of God. And so in verse 2 we read, and after six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, doesn't have all of his disciples, just some of them, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And so only three of the disciples get to go. Peter and James and John are some standing there, and they are clearly given a glimpse of the kingdom coming in power because they get to see the glory of the king. Look at the end of verse 2. And he, that's Jesus, was transfigured before before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now that's a crazy sight, isn't it? Jesus' face and body and even his clothes, they transform from what would look common like like just a Jewish man, and he is glowing like he's intensely white. If you've ever looked at the sun too long, you know what that looks like, right? Now, don't go try this after the service, okay? I mean, sign a waiver first if you're going to do that. But, you you know, you look at the sun for too long, and and it just turns white, and then what happens when you look away? You have that kind of white spot that keeps showing, right? I get that sometimes from the spotlights. There's like this white spot. Why? Because it's so radiant, it's burning your eyes. It's that bright. It's that light. Well, that imagery of being radiant and intensely white, That's the same kind of description that's used of God in Psalm 104 and in Daniel 7, where we also see the Son of Man in the presence of God. And so if you would have encountered that kind of radiance and that kind of intense white and glow in a person, you would know that something divine was going on, and you probably wouldn't know what to say or do in that moment. I mean, it would just be so amazing. Neither does Peter. And when Peter doesn't know what to do, he opens his mouth. Look at verse 5. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. So, So Peter sees Moses and Elijah in this glorified version of Jesus, and he is starstruck. Uh, Moses is the hero from Exodus. He is the one who received the law directly from God at Mount Sinai. 
Uh, Elijah is the hero of Mount Carmel who defeated the prophets of Baal and the one who was prophesied to come before the Lord would come. He is starstruck. And then you have Jesus and he's glowing and he's talking to them like they're old friends. And Peter's like, this is awesome. We, we have three of the greatest leaders of our faith right here. It's good. This is good that we're here. We need to keep you here. Hurry, get them a tabernacle, get them a tent. They're going to live with us. They're going to live with us just like we did when we left Egypt. Man, the promised land's coming, baby. Right? That's where Peter's at. He's so excited about what's taking place here. Now, here's the problem with that. Peter is thinking of Jesus and Moses and Elijah as though they're equals. He calls Jesus rabbi or teacher, and then he suggests that that teacher can equally dwell in tents like Moses and Elijah. See, Peter's missing the point. This isn't a meet and greet with Israel's prophets of old. This isn't a supernatural strategy meeting to to summon leaders from the past to figure out how to inaugurate Jesus' kingdom. No, this is Jesus showing himself greater than Moses and Elijah, and it is a glimpse for his disciples to give them a taste of the power of the kingdom of God and a glimpse of the glory of Jesus because he is the only son of the Most High God. That's what this is. And to make sure that Peter and James and John know that, God the Father interrupts Peter's sentence to himself come down to the mountain in a cloud to testify that Jesus is different and better than Moses and Elijah. Look at verse 7. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking all around, they, saw, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. In other words, Jesus is different. Jesus is unique among all men because only Jesus is my beloved son. And when the cloud leaves and Moses and Elijah are gone, the spotlight is left where it belongs. There's only Jesus there. So what does it all mean? Well, you notice that's what's happened in these first eight verses Just like Moses took three named men and these 70 elders up to a high mountain to hear from God, and God's presence came down in a cloud of glory, here Jesus takes three men with him to a high mountain, and God comes down to meet them in a cloud of glory, and God speaks to them. But... Unlike Moses, whose face glowed because he had been in the cloud of the presence of God, Jesus is radiant and intensely white before the cloud even shows up. Why? Because unlike Moses and Elijah or any other mere prophet, Jesus is the Son of God. And he is the one who all of those prophets in the past were pointing to all along. And God the Father himself has come to testify to it. And we have these three witnesses who have seen it and heard it. So that Peter will testify later on, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, for when he, that's Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. You know how Peter defines that moment? He defines it as a time where Jesus received honor and glory from his Father. So point number one this morning, the transfiguration is a call to honor Jesus because Jesus is glorious in his being. He is glorious in just who he is. Just who Jesus is makes him majestic and full of amazement and awe. It's like if you've ever gone to the Grand Canyon or, or Niagara Falls or you went to the coast and you saw a sunset on the Oregon coast and, and the waves are crashing and you could hear the roar of it and there it is, this beautiful sunset, haystack rock, it's all there. You look at it and you say, that is amazing. That is glorious. It doesn't need any architecture to be built up around it to make it majestic. They don't need people to do any touch-up work to make it look amazing. They don't need anything about them to be added to make you feel small and to say, wow. 
They're glorious simply because of what they are. Well, that's what the transfiguration of Jesus shows us about Jesus. That Jesus is glorious simply in who he is. He is the majestic son of God who lives in glory and splendor. Now that should amaze us, shouldn't it? Shouldn't that cause us to have our jaw drop and say, wow, look how glorious he is. It should cause us to live in utter astonishment each day that we as a sinful people have the privilege of knowing him. We should be daily struck by the grace that such an amazing being would want to have relationship with us. And that reality should lead us to worship him constantly, shouldn't it? Yes or no? Yes. And yet, if you're like me, sometimes it's easy to forget that. It's easy to forget how amazing and glorious Jesus is and to be more amazed with lesser things. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. There's a YouTube channel called People Are Awesome. And on this channel, there are videos of people doing uh, amazing, death-defying, and and hard-to-believe things. They do stunts on water skis and snow skis and motorcycles and skateboards. They do it in the gym. They do it in the air. They do it underwater. I think they've even done one in space. And it has 3.6 million subscribers. So so there are 3.6 million people who say, anytime you put on a new video, I want to know. We as people love to be thrilled and amazed and awe. And that's not bad. But we honor those who do that for us by watching their videos and we call them awesome. And we do it by the millions every day. But how many of us who might be amazed by those things, sometimes we'll open our Bibles and we read about Jesus and we're bored. Why? Why aren't we awestruck by Jesus? Maybe maybe it's because we've forgotten that Jesus is the one who holds the cells of all of those awesome people together. Maybe it's because we have forgotten that Jesus is the one who makes their muscles work. Maybe it's because we've forgotten that Jesus is the one who created the water and the sky and the ground that they use as their playground. Maybe it's because we've forgotten that Jesus is the one who controls the laws of nature that they get to play in, and when they seem to defy the laws of nature, it's because Jesus permitted it. And maybe it's because we've forgotten that Jesus is the one for whose glory all of those people were created in the first place, so that we would not say that people are awesome, that we would say Jesus is awesome. But we forget that. We forget that. And so we honor Jesus by singing on Sundays, but on Monday, we often go back to looking for other things to amaze us. And when I say we, I'm with you in that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if that's us, we have a worship problem. Because no glimpse of awesomeness that we see in human beings, whether it's doing amazing things, or or thinking amazing thoughts, or writing amazing words... No human awesomeness exists without the awesomeness of Jesus making it happen. And so, if it helps you to worship Jesus, then maybe you need to discipline yourself to honor Jesus verbally when you see something amazing. Maybe you need to train yourself to to express out loud, Wow, Jesus! What a beautiful view that you made happen right in front of me. Wow, Jesus, what an amazing skill that you have equipped this person to be able to put into practice. Wow, Jesus, what a glorious mind that you have given to people to think such amazing things. Maybe you need to discipline yourself to do that. So that you will give honor to the Jesus who deserves it. Because he is glorious in his very being. Just in who he is. 
Now, there is another way to show him honor. We see that here in the transfiguration as well. So point number two this morning, the transfiguration is a call to hear Jesus because Jesus is glorious in his teaching. You'll notice that when God the Father speaks about his son, he gives this command in verse 7, listen to him. Now, that should have rang some bells in the disciples' minds, especially having just seen Moses in their presence. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15, if you remember, they were told that a prophet like Moses would come, and they were commanded to listen to him. Well, clearly Jesus is this prophet. He has the endorsement of God the Father to teach and obey. And Jesus has already spoken in ways that are more authoritative than any of the prophets before him. If you remember, the Old Testament prophets, they were speaking, but they weren't speaking their own words. They were speaking the words of God. And so whenever they would preface something, they would say, they would say, thus says the Lord, right? It wasn't their words, it was the words of God. But you'll notice when you look back at verse 1, Jesus doesn't talk like that. How does Jesus begin when he speaks? He doesn't say, thus says the Lord. He says, truly, I say to you. In other words, thus says me. Right? I am, I am the Lord. This is my word. And everything the Lord says is true. And because it's true, it is worthy of awe and splendor. And it is worthy of hearing and obeying. Now, in light of that, I want you to consider this thought this morning. If Jesus is glorious in his teaching, if he is glorious and worthy of splendor and amazement in his teaching, then why do we sometimes go to other people first when we need answers? Why do we do that? What is competing with Jesus for your ears? Is it your favorite website or podcast? Or your favorite spiritual guru? Do we go to those before we go to Jesus? If so, just think about this. If you want the best teaching on a topic, who should you go to? Probably the person who invented that thing or who knows the most about it, right? That's who you should go to. Well, there's no better teacher than Jesus. And so, are you having problems in your marriage? Jesus' teaching on a healthy marriage comes from the author of marriage, Are you having challenges in parenting? You're dealing with your kids. Jesus' teaching on parenting comes from the one who invented parenting. Do you have a moral dilemma or an ethical question? Jesus' teaching on right and wrong comes from the one who is the truth. Do you have fears? Because you don't know what the future holds. Jesus' teaching on the future comes from a king who holds the future in his sovereign hands. Jesus is glorious in his teaching. And his teaching is his Bible. And so listen to him. Pick it up. Read it. And then do it. So where are you looking for answers? Where are you looking for wisdom and advice? If you're looking to others instead of Jesus, not only are you disobeying God the Father who says, this is my beloved son, listen to him, but you're also not getting the best teaching there is because only Jesus is glorious in his teaching. And then finally this morning, point number three, the transfiguration calls us to hope because Jesus is glorious in his suffering. He is glorious and he is glorified in his suffering. After the transfiguration was over, it was time for them to to leave the mountain. And in verses 9 through 13, we see the disciples trying to process all that's taken place. And so Jesus uses this as an opportunity to gloriously teach them. Look at verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him." 
Now, as I said earlier, the disciples didn't have any concept of the Son of Man and this prophet like Moses also being this suffering servant. And so it didn't make sense to them because in their their understanding, the coming of Elijah was to restore all things and to usher in the Son of Man to reign in his kingdom. And so there was no room for the Son of Man's suffering in that equation. So they have questions. If Jesus is the Son of Man, then where's Elijah? Elijah. And where does this suffering come in, and why? Well, Jesus answers their questions by affirming that Elijah must come, and then he notes in verse 13 that Elijah had come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Now, Mark doesn't say it, but Matthew notes in Matthew chapter 17 that John the Baptist was the the Elijah sent to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. And he says in verse 12, they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the son of man will certainly suffer at their hands. So consider the context here. They have just seen the Old Testament Elijah on the mountain in front of them. And Jesus tells his disciples, John the Baptist was the New Testament Elijah. And in being killed by Herod, he suffered to prepare the way for Jesus to come and to also suffer. Here's the thing I want you to focus on this morning as we close. That suffering was always part of the plan to glorify Jesus. It was always part of the plan. And therefore, because the plan worked, that should give us hope. Here's why. The disciples' question about about Elijah, what prompts that? If you look at the text, what prompts their question? It's prompted because Jesus talks about rising from the dead. Verse 9, it says, He charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And then in verse 12, he said to them, it was written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things. And so what Jesus is saying is, his suffering is a part of God's plan. It was written in the scriptures. It was prophesied to come. But they're not to tell anyone about it, what they've seen on this mountain, until, until, until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And so what is Jesus saying is certain in that command? What's certain? He's going to rise, right? He is going to rise. They can know that he is going to rise from the dead. And therefore, there is hope. Why? Because they have just seen him glorified on this mountain. And after his suffering, he will rise by the plan of God. And he will be even more glorified because of his suffering. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says he is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. And here's why that is full of hope for you and me. First, it means that we have a future glorification of Jesus to look forward to. Someday Jesus is going to return in glory and splendor. Revelation chapter 1 says... Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, those who caused him to suffer. Someday the Jesus who suffered on our behalf is going to be glorified in front of everyone. But it also means that there's hope for us. Hope as we go through suffering, even now, on Christ's behalf. Just listen to how the scriptures speak of our suffering in this life. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that he suffered that I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Knowing Jesus and knowing his power comes from suffering with Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Paul isn't saying that there's anything that was lacking in Jesus dying and what he did on the cross for us. What he's saying is that when we suffer for Christ, then it is Jesus gloriously continuing to suffer for his church through our suffering because he suffers with us. We suffer with him. We suffer his sufferings. And Peter says we are to rejoice in hope for that. 
1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is re- revealed. We get to be glad in sharing in Christ's sufferings because a day is coming when that suffering will be over and we will rejoice with Jesus when He returns in glory. And so Jesus was glorious in His suffering on the cross. Jesus is glorious in his suffering now as we suffer in the church, and Jesus will be glorious in his suffering as he returns and is glorified for it. Because he won't return to be a suffering servant again. He already did that. But because he endured that suffering perfectly, he will return as the glorious Son of Man. And in fact, as we close this morning, that's what we are proclaiming as we take communion. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, in communion, we proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim His suffering. Even as we suffer with Him, even as we face trials, we identify with Him, we proclaim His suffering until He comes. That's our hope. That's our hope. And the transfiguration of Jesus is just a taste of what we have to look forward to because Jesus is glorious. Now, doesn't that make you want to worship him? Let's pray as we prepare for communion. Jesus, thank you that you are worthy. Thank you that you are glorious. And thank you that even in your suffering, and in fact because of your suffering, you were even more glorified because you were crowned with glory and honor. Lord, you lived a perfect life. You gave that life as a sacrifice for us. And as we take communion, we remember what you did for us, even as we prepare for your coming. Lord, I pray that you would work on our hearts, that you would help us to be consistently in awe and in amazement of who you are. That, Lord, we would not allow other things to take the place of awe in our hearts, but instead that, Jesus, we would gaze on your beauty and your glory every day and give you praise for it. And we ask that you'd help us as we prepare our hearts to take communion together. In Jesus' name.